Hello, Politics Plus Media 101 listeners. It is the final days before the election of 2024. Justin and I are back again to talk about the race. Justin, we haven't recorded for a little while. We've both been traveling quite a bit, working pretty hard. I know in your case on some politically relevant issues, uh, but I think that it's important that we gather again in the last days before the race to talk about what we're seeing. Yes, and this thing could not be any closer. Uh, the swing state polls are anywhere from plus three Harris to plus three t- Trump or somewhere in between there. Uh, Pennsylvania, a state Harris absolutely needs to win to have a chance at an, a victory, is tied in almost every single poll. It's as close as you can get. Uh, while that race is close, it looks like people are feeling more and more confident on predicting the House will go blue and the Senate will go red, but there's certainly a ton of uh, different topics to get into from uh, the late October surprises that we've seen to more tactical and strategic analysis of how both campaigns are handling different aspects of getting out the vote. Um, So this should be a fun episode. Yeah, I think you've put your finger on really what's the headline takeaway from a horse race prognostication standpoint, which is that this race is quite close. And as we look through the last several cycles, we've had the same candidate on the Republican side each time. But this race is looking a lot closer than either of the last two. Uh, 2016 turned out to be quite close. The polling ahead of the race wasn't as close. And then 2020, neither the polling nor the result were really that close, right? The result ended up being closer than what the polling was showing. The polling was showing ahead of the 2020 election that Biden was ahead by eight or nine points in most of the key states or many of the key states. The result ended up closer, but you still had a pretty big electoral college gap and Trump wasn't that close to winning four or five states that he would have needed to in order to win the election. Seven million votes behind in the popular vote. This is the closest that Trump seems to have run yet in the polling. Yeah, it it really is a toss up. Some, Some of this, John, could be due to hurting because of what you just mentioned last cycle, the swing states were like plus seven, plus eight for Biden in some of these swing states. Um, so I've seen some analysis, you know, from folks like Nate Silver, aggregators, prognosticators, uh, the folks that work with statistics, even if they aren't pollsters themselves. And there's uh, almost a prevailing view that uh, all these numbers are looking kind of similar. And for our audience, hurting is when um, pollsters try and um, cre- use methodologies, sample sizes and whatnot to basically have a poll that is fitting closely with the prevailing view of the election by other reputable pollsters. Um, And once hurting starts, it can have kind of a contagious effect on much of the polling industry. So we we could be seeing that, uh, or we could legitimately be seeing a polarized country that is on a knife's edge. And a lot of these states are going to come down to tens of thousands of votes, which is nothing when a lot of these states have millions and millions of people. I don't think anybody can predict uh, the outcome with any type of certainty. But I do think VP Harris is in the best position she could possibly be in, considering that mere months ago, Joe Biden was down seven five, six, seven points in many of these swing states and losing support um, almost daily. So for her to come in, run a campaign for a few months and um, be no worse than a coin flip, I I think that that's the best thing that she could hope for. And I think she's closing strong. And, um, you know, I think she's going to win this election. Wow. That's a stronger prediction than I was expecting. I was going to ask you instead, of trying to predict who would win to ask you, who would you rather be? Whose shoes would you rather be in? But it seems like the answer to both is going to be Kamala Harris. Yes, it, it's got to be, right, John? Take away Trump for a second. We look at her strategy. Uh, the last two weeks, uh, strategically, tactically rather, um, what she's done is two weeks ago and a little bit last week, she's really focused on uplifting her moderate bona fides, going on stage with Liz Cheney, rolling out a bunch of Republican endorsements, including um, 
uh, George W. Bush's daughter most recently, a few days ago. Um, and her message has been strong national security, strong on the border, uh, issues that truly resonate, but also abortion, which resonates with a lot of these uh, suburban women um, that think the Supreme Court has gone too far, the Republican Party has gone too far. So that was her message. Uh, and then now, if we look at the speech on Tuesday night, uh, October 29th, outside of the ellipse, uh, sure, the speech referenced January 6th, but it wasn't one of those Biden um, just for completely for the base where it was demagoguery and fear, kind of like he did in Philadelphia. This was a speech that definitely drew a contrast between herself and Trump, but it was accessible to moderates, independents, uh, uh, swing voters, uh, and also had some aspects that fired up the base. So I think that that speech um, is important because that capstones her outreach to these moderate voters. Now what we're seeing in the closing days of the election is just an absolutely amazing flood of celebrity endorsements and celebrities getting engaged. Today, Jennifer Aniston tweeted out to her 44.5 million followers that she voted for uh, VP Harris. You have uh, Puerto Rican stars, J-Lo, uh, Mark Anthony, Bad Bunny, uh, if you aggregate up all their Instagram followers, 350 million Instagram followers uh, between just just the few people, uh, they've all come out recent days uh, endorsing uh, VP Harris. Uh, and you even have Puerto Rican superstars, uh, Nikki Jam, for example, today reversed his endorsement of Trump. So uh, it's just impressive to see this outpouring of support that does two things. One, it gets information to maybe lower info voters uh, who receive their news from different sources, like, for example, celebrities. Uh, and then the second thing it does is it inspires the base to come out and, and vote harder, work harder, phone bank, donate more. Her overall strategy has been so different from the way that she ran for president in the 2019-2020 cycle. I think that you indicated that a little bit with how you described the way that she's been approaching voters. You could watch that convention that she held this summer and think that it was a Republican convention, frankly. The messaging was very squarely aimed at moderates and conservatives and male voters and people who were prioritizing things like immigration enforcement and capitalism and a thriving stock market. And if you look at the visual imagery and the ambiance of the event, it was American flags, it was chants of USA, USA, things that for good reason or not, the Republican Party have earned an association with through their recent messaging over the last couple of decades, probably longer. Uh, I think that that rally that she held at the Ellipse was useful in this way. Uh, not just because it was evoking memories of Trump's attack on the Capitol on January 6th, but also because it had that veneer of patriotism, American monuments, American flags in the background, but also because it helps people visualize what Kamala Harris might look like as president. When you see her give a speech in front of the actual White House, uh, adjacent to the Washington Monument, in that setting in Washington, D.C., with a large crowd, it looks almost like the setting for an inaugural address. So you can imagine what she would look like were she president of the United States. And I think that that's something that some candidates in the past, probably especially female candidates for president, have had a difficult time doing because people have not seen someone like them in that setting before. Male candidates too, people like Michael Dukakis, the inability of the public to really picture that person as commander in chief. Just a number of Democrats holding American flags was amazing to see. And and I do think the imagery and pageantry that you described is important because um, anybody who watches any type of sporting event understands this. Uh, the crowd, in a lot of ways, makes the event. Uh, it, 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 we are all you know human beings and we can relate to 50, 75,000 people who have energy, who have unity, and, and who are cheering loudly. And the energy is the second thing that struck me along with all those American flags. This is a campaign whose base is energized 
because of the other candidate in the race. Um, and then is what the speech is. Um, Eminem in Detroit, John, that's, that's targeting, uh, young men, our age, Eminem, he he's targeting us, which is a soft spot, uh, for this campaign. We got to also acknowledge that there have been some egregious unforced errors, uh, by the Trump campaign in contrast, as Harris is widening the tent, it's almost like Trump is closing the tent and kicking people out of it. Yeah, I think energy is a difficult thing to measure. Uh, I'm not sure how the polling is really able to capture that. You know, they make a distinction between likely voters and registered voters. The likely voters are the ones who are more inclined to get to the polls. But I think that that measurement is a little bit different from what we talk about with the energy, the vibe, so to speak, an overused vague term. Uh, it's the sense of emotion and excitement that you feel more anecdotally when you speak to voters or hear from voters or read voters on social media. I think that when we talk about the likely voters, when we get into this question of whose shoes you'd rather be in, and a big component of this is the demographic trade-off that seems to be happening between the two campaigns based on results that we've seen in demographic polling. So a big narrative of this campaign, a big feature of this campaign has been the story that the Trump campaign are doing better than Republicans have in the last several cycles with uh, Black and Hispanic voters, especially young men, and that the Harris campaign, conversely, are doing better with educated voters than ever before and uh, doing better with white educated voters in particular to a degree that Democrats haven't in recent past. So there's a demographic trade-off here, right? The Trump campaign winning over young black and Hispanic men to a certain degree, and the Harris campaign trading those voters for educated white voters to a certain degree. So when we think about whose shoes you'd rather be in, you take a look at this trade-off and you wonder if it might actually benefit Harris quite a bit, right? The turnout patterns that we've had, we've all heard this a million times. The voters that don't turn out at the degree that they should are often young voters in particular, and then also minority Americans. Those are the voters that are often the hardest to actually turn out. And the voters that tend to be the most likely to turn out are educated voters, especially suburban women. And that's part of why the Democrats have overperformed according to expectations in, for example, the 2022 uh, congressional elections. So all of this suggests that maybe, even though the trade-off is scary for Democrats who have fallen in love with a coalition that they had in 2008 and 2012 with Obama, maybe the trade-off will actually benefit them when it comes to voter turnout in the key states. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, though, uh, that one segment of young voters is as energized as ever, and that's young women, young women on college campuses, young women that just turned 18, and they are energized because of abortion. So while we have seen a lot of coverage about issues like um, Israel-Palestine depressing young voter turnout, um, I think that Ultimately, structurally, because of the way that the GOP approaches abortion, which they want to ban it, because the way that Trump talks and acts and then talks specifically about women, along with all of the sexual assault, uh, probably worse allegations that he has faced, that structurally, I would much rather be in the Democrats' position vis-a-vis young voters. Also, Democrats are scared about the uh, change in fortune of early voting numbers. Uh, so what we're seeing in a lot of these states is Republicans are voting uh, at disproportionately high rates through mail and early voting than we had previously seen in 2022, 2020. Um, and, and 2020 is really a line of demarcation because of how much more widespread uh, mail-in voting and early voting uh, became due to the pandemic. Um I think that we can't read that much into it. We have no idea what this means for a day of Republican turnout. Are they are they just all voting now? And and will their turnouts be uh, lower on election day than is uh, relatively expected from their coalition? Number two, the coalitions are changing. Yeah, the change in the coalitions is an interesting thing to talk about. I think before we get into it a little bit more, though, we should probably make some caveats. So when you hear the dialogue about Trump's sudden success with black and Latino voters, it sometimes feels as though we're talking about Trump winning a majority of these voters. That's not really what's happening. Trump is going from winning 
8% of black voters in the last election to winning, according to polling, maybe something like 16 or 17%. That's still quite a low number. That's still Democrats winning 80% of those voters and more. So I think that there can be a misleading conversation because people are reacting to a trend and extrapolating that and speaking as if all of a sudden Trump is winning black voters, when in reality, he's doing quite poorly with them and still losing four out of five. With Hispanic voters, Trump is doing much better than that, winning maybe in the low 40s or high 30s. This is better than John McCain and Mitt Romney did. It's better than Trump did in previous election cycles. But it's not even quite as good as George W. Bush did with Hispanic voters in 2004. So it's not an unprecedented level of support among Latino or Hispanic voters for Republicans, even in recent elections. So there is movement. It's a change to the way that we've gotten used to politics working in the last 10 years or so, but it's not a complete revolution in reorientation of the system. Trump was, based on reputable polls and depending on what poll you looked at when you were looking at it, on pace to do better than George W. Bush in 2004. Um, There was one poll uh, that was relatively recent that showed him only losing um, Latinos, Hispanic voters, uh, by 13 points to Harris. Whereas um, in 2020, I believe, uh, Biden carried Hispanic voters by double that margin, 26%. In 2016, Trump lost Hispanic voters to Hillary Clinton by 39%. Uh, so he was doing well. And um, I think it's important to tie it back to our energy and turnout question um, because uh, Democrats need specifically black voters to turn out at higher levels. And if they do turn out at higher levels and Trump wins a couple more percentage points with those voters, then it probably um, wouldn't be the death now. But if there is a low turnout with these voting blocks and he's doing 10 or 20 points better, um in a tight election rate, that that margin is going to be incredibly difficult to make up because who would she make that up with? We're only seeing her get 1.2% of of former Republican voters. So the math gets real tricky real fast when you boil it down to those seven states and and turnout isn't where the campaign needs it to be. Uh, And those couple percentage points Trump's running better um, may matter. You mentioned, Justin, that some polling was showing that Trump was going to lose Hispanic or Latino voters by only 13 percent. That would still actually not be as good as George W. Bush did in 2004, because in 2004, George W. Bush won 44 percent, according to exit polls. So even if Gore or sorry, Kerry had won the remaining 56 percent of the vote, that's only a 12 point gap. So I think that Just to your point, Trump is significantly, significantly increasing his vote share uh, according to his previous cycles as a candidate. But we are maybe forgetting what the previous norm was and could be for Republicans among Hispanic and Latino voters, because in 2004, they ran almost even. They ran really quite well. Um, About the former Republicans, it's kind of funny because this is now a long term shift. you know, if we look at Republicans and how they voted in 2016, we're talking about switching from Romney to Trump. But now that Trump's been the Republican candidate for all of that time, are you even still a former Republican if you're someone who's been turned off by Trump for, for such a long time? I mean, maybe the measure you're looking at is people voted for Trump in 2020. And yeah, that might be a difficult uh, thing to move. But I'm sure that there's been a very significant movement of Republicans since 2012 over to over to the uh, Harris voting block right now. Yeah, yes, but they're mostly overeducated elites, and there just aren't many uh, of that voting demographic. Like, as a, like I'm thinking, like Tom Nichols <laughs> and George Conway. It's like, yes, you're right. Like 90 percent of those type moved over. The educated elites are a pretty good voting block to have in this country where a significant number of people do have college degrees. And a lot of them live in key suburban counties and swing states in Atlanta and Philadelphia. And they can be decisive in an election. New York City, Boston, San Francisco. These are some of the most likely voters to show up and turn out. So that's what I'm saying. The demographic trade-off I mean, Democrats might love having young voters because it makes them feel like they're on the right moral side and they represent the future. But 
you would rather have the middle-aged voter with a college degree than the young voter because the middle-aged voter with a college degree is much more likely to show up and, and actually vote for you according to the turnout that we've seen election after election after election. I think you definitely want to be Harris at this point. Looks like most of the blue wall is holding. And the reports I'm hearing from on the ground is that uh, the energy is there in Detroit to, to turn out. Um, so, and that's a big state where you've had a bunch of former Republicans come out, uh, Fred Upton, former member of Congress, respected, come out and endorse uh, Kamala Harris. If Michigan's in her basket and it looks like Wisconsin's trending well and turnout in the big cities will be up again, uh, then all eyes turn to Pennsylvania and Trump has had some exceptionally unforced errors um, in ways that uniquely impact that state and then close swing uh, districts for the House of Representatives in New York. Um, so although structurally the Harris campaign have been worried about energy in Philadelphia, um, there's been media reports attacking their approach to campaigning. Uh, I think they got extremely lucky with the uh, racist comments about Puerto Rico. A lot going on. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. All right. Okay. We're getting there. Again, normally I don't follow the national anthem, everybody. Uh, this isn't exactly a perfect comedy setup. There's some people here. All right. Very good. I like it. So let's let's talk about that then, Justin, because I know that this is an important issue to you. Uh, you worked for the government of Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria when Trump was president and when Trump's response to that hurricane was quite controversial and had a pretty big impact on the welfare of people on the island. And you're still very closely connected to, to the issue and, and still working with uh, people who are involved in uh, Puerto Rican issues. So I think you and I had been talking Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to talk about this on the podcast because of our long time off. But you and I have been talking a lot offline about how these 500,000 Puerto Rican American voters who live in the state of Pennsylvania are being kind of ignored in the national media narratives. And there was a real opportunity for campaigns to speak to them directly to try to move the needle in that important swing state. Yeah, we'd been talking about it for two months. Uh, we were like, this election is going to be a coin flip. It's going to be very close. Uh, 320,000 registered Puerto Rican voters in Pennsylvania uh, in a state that came down to 80,000 voters in 2020. Um, you would think that if you could pull a net 20, 10 or 20,000 of these Puerto Rican voters to your side, that that could be the difference in a potentially even closer election this time around. And to set the stage, a lot of the narrative about the Harris campaign not doing well with young men, Hispanic voters, were specifically talking about young Puerto Rican voters in Pennsylvania. Because without that state, she loses, folks. When you're worried about are black men going to come out in droves on election night to uh, vote for her in Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, in the suburbs of those cities, you need to pick up the vote somewhere. Um, and quite frankly, the Harris campaign was doing a horrible job at outreach to these voters before this moment in time. It was like they were ignoring them. Um, in uh, The messaging was general and broad. It was talking about the themes that they're talking about generally on the campaign, uh, but also that they are using with every other Hispanic voting group. It's like the Harris campaign looked at a poll, saw that uh, the economy was number one. Immigration was the number three issue. Uh, and they and they saw that issue, the crime was an issue. So what did they do? They just cut ads. It was nothing specific to Puerto Rico, to Puerto Rican cultural identity. And as we all know, the issues that make us feel something as human beings are usually those strong, most strongly tied to our identity, our sense of self, how we perceive ourselves in this world. And the Harris campaign wasn't doing that. That began to change when Mark Anthony, a Puerto Rican celebrity, cut an advertisement focused on Hurricane Maria and Trump's disgusting, degrading, despicable uh, response to that tragedy uh, and really how he um, inflamed the feelings of despair and 
bluntly hatred that many on the island of Puerto Rico uh, felt for him at that time. Um, but just a minute long online ad that probably ran in a few TV spots in Pennsylvania is not enough to energize a core voting block to come out. Yeah, Justin, I think that the Democrats had partially learned a lesson from recent election cycles that their previous messaging that was one size fits all to Spanish speaking Americans was not working. And that one size fits all message had to do with the Southern border and immigration enforcement, stuff about the Dream Act, uh, stuff about deportations. This was the way that Democratic campaigns were, it seemed, talking to the entire country, all the Spanish speaking people in the country. And so some very smart analysts, people like Mike Madrid, were hammering on about how most Spanish-speaking voters in the United States care about the economy more than anything else. And most Spanish speakers in the U.S. are part of the working class. And so the economic messaging that appeals to working class Americans across the board is going to be the most effective thing for Spanish-speaking working class Americans. So to your point, that is a lesson that the Harris campaign seems to have learned. And that's why we ended up with the messaging that you were just describing that was focused so much on the economy. From what we've seen in polling, Harris's economic messaging seems to have been very successful. Uh, we've seen some polls, you and I were sharing these, that showed how much ground she made up in perceptions of who is going to be a better shepherd of the economy uh, compared to where Biden was before he decided not to run in this election cycle. I think she made up 20, 30 percentage points on a lot of the key questions. So this messaging was landing. But as we talk about how you can tailor messages to certain audiences, I mean, even though we've shifted maybe from one one size fits all messaging that wasn't working, we've maybe shifted to another kind of one size fits all messaging. And part of the reason why voters in the Northeast who speak Spanish weren't responding to stuff about the Dream Act and the Southern border is because voters in the Northeast who speak Spanish aren't generally Mexican Americans. And that was something that maybe the political class in the United States had yet to recognize. Most Americans who speak Spanish are of Mexican heritage. They're Mexican Americans. Uh, but their populations are concentrated in the Southwest, especially in California, but also in Texas, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and so on. Nevada, which is actually a key swing state in this cycle. Uh, but in a place like Pennsylvania, a huge number of the Spanish speakers are Puerto Ricans. And to your point, Justin, no one had really been talking to them about some of these important issues because previously it was about the DREAM Act and the southern border, and now it's all about the economy. So there's been a long-term missed opportunity to talk to these voters about issues that matter to them that are maybe specific to their community. Yes, and uh, it's the island that the Trump comedian who was like a D or an F-lister uh, so idiotically called a floating island of garbage. A lot of these people that moved to uh, the mainland United States still have family there. Um, so you could roll out policy platforms that talk about the island. You could go even further and say the island should be the 51st state, which I unequivocally believe in, and, and I support that movement um, and, and work intimately with it uh, as a disclosure. Um, but but the Harris campaign didn't, like, they weren't doing anything. Uh, to that point, Sunday, the, uh, what what is this, 10 days before the election, uh, VP Harris decided to roll out her policy platform for Puerto Rico. Early voting had been underway for weeks. And if you don't even have a policy platform for how you are going to be better on the issue of Puerto Rico than your opponent, how are you cutting digital ads highlighting this juxtaposition? How are you speaking to these people about how you're going to improve the safety, security, and economic prosperity of their family if you're not talking about half of their family that's living in a U.S. territory that has no federal representation that can vote? Um, and is largely forgotten by the mainstream media. Uh, so I agree with everything you're saying, John. I think it's really smart that she focused on the economy, specifically with these groups. I think it's smart that she stopped 
talking about liberalizing immigration to these groups uh, in a way that does not always resonate with them. Um, But also, it's very important. You can't just have somebody of Puerto Rican descent waving a Puerto Rican flag in a video that's talking about nothing specific to these people uh, other than a promise that you're going to be better than the opponent on the economy uh, and expect them to have any type of uh, overwhelmingly warm feelings, energy, drive to get out there uh, and and vote for you. So I, I just think it was a little bit uh, ham-fisted and disorganized. But what happened was the Harris campaign was making an unforced error. And then the Trump campaign said, hold my beer. We are going to attack these people for an issue that is ingrained in their cultural identity. They have an amazing culture. They are basically the fusion of the Caribbean, the Latin countries, and the United States. And it's such a unique culture that has been part of the United States for over 125 years now. Uh, the island, you could make an argument, it's the most beautiful island that is um, that the U- U.S. has control of. You could put it right up there with Hawaii. Um, it is, I would say, the crown jewel of the East Coast islands in the United States, certainly. Um, and these people know that. And their families, their abuelos, abuelas, uh, their nieces and nephews, even brothers and sisters, their parents are still living on the island. Why the comment was so offensive is because Puerto Rico has been an afterthought of the United States for 125 years. It's been under colonial rule of the United States. The the people have had um, virtually no say in policies that impact them. There was recently Hurricane Maria in 2016, uh, 2017, a massive natural disaster where Puerto Rico received the worst of, of the damage, but they were third on the list. Florida and Houston got all of the federal support first as People were dying in nursing homes because electricity ran out and they couldn't get their dialysis or their ventilators went out, uh, where the the island didn't have electricity and running water basically for two months, no telecommunication system. Uh, and the U.S. response was to send wrong satellite phones to the island. It was to not have enough water uh, and food staged. It was to not act with urgency was to send a president to the island to insult the people and throw paper towels at them as 4,000 of their uh, fellow citizens on the island are, are in the, were in the process of perishing um, from this event and Trump's horrific response. So it is an identity where they do feel and are aware of the colonialism in, in the U.S. leaving the island behind and disregarding them. And to have somebody come out, there is no humor in the joke. It wasn't a joke. It wasn't alluding to anything culturally in Puerto Rico. There was no context where it made any sense. He just basically calls the island of Puerto Rico garbage um, because he sees these people as not Americans, as brown people, and he thinks that it's going to resonate with Trump, who is racist and who has had his run-ins with Puerto Rican politicians, and MAGA voters. Not all MAGA voters, but there is a large portion of MAGA voters who don't like brown people. And that's why Trump's running on setting up deportation to round up uh, Hispanic people uh, and deport them. Uh, So what it did was immediately it struck at these people in a way that uh, I have never, I can't remember an issue striking at such a vital voting bloc group the days before the election uh, because it struck at their pride. It struck at how they view themselves in the world and their experiences on the island of Puerto Rico. And what you had happened, John, um, was just an insane amount of communication on Telegram, on Signal, on WhatsApp, on social media sites. It wasn't top down. It wasn't celebrity driven. It wasn't anything the Harris campaign did. It was just immense amounts of anger. Um, And and you saw it from socialist leaning Democrats to religious right Christian Puerto Ricans. Um, The other thing about the Puerto Rican cultural identity that's important is almost like no other people, because they've been in a situation where they have legally been oppressed for 125 years, 
Um, and it, it, once they feel attacked, they all unify, despite being a very divided society on many different levels. They all unify. They all come together to fight for a common good and to wrong a right. They fight to beat back an injustice. Um, so you saw this grassroots type of response. And then consequently, immediately almost every single major Puerto Rican celebrity started coming out, um, disavowing the comments and endorsing Harris overnight. Yeah, I was comparing this comedian a little bit to Steve Bartman. I don't know if the listeners all know who that is. I know that Justin definitely knows who this is. So there was an incident, maybe it was 20 years ago at this point, where the Chicago Cubs were playing a playoff game and they were about to advance to the next round. I think they're about to go into the World Series. And uh, a ball is going, it's been hit, it's going to be caught out and it's going to end the game and win the game for the Cubs, I think, right? And a Cubs fan reaches out with his mitt that he brought from home to catch the ball because he wants to have a souvenir to bring home. And by interfering in the play, the Cubs aren't able to get the out and it ruins their chances of going to the next round. It spoils the outcome and the Cubs end up getting eliminated. So this guy who was an anonymous fan rooting for the Cubs uh, went out there, sabotaged his own team's chances of advancing to the next round and then became this hate object among the fans of his own team and uh he was getting death threats people were trying to kill this guy who were fellow cubs fans because they said one of us has ruined our chances of going we're about to go to the world series and and finally end our long drought of championships the comedian who spoke and made this inappropriate joke is a little bit like steve barman here he's a relatively anonymous person who had not been in the news before, had not been prominently associated with the Trump campaign, but he's gone out there and in in an instant has seriously damaged his own side's chances of winning this election and is going to become a scapegoat by other Republicans, just like Bartman. They'll be sending him death threats. They'll be trying to kill him and they're going to blame him for any bad outcome that happens on election day. Just to undermine this, we were talking about how Harris campaign, in my opinion, didn't do a great job leading up to that, how getting a net of 10 to 20,000 voters um, in this specific voting block, the Puerto Rican voting block, um, would be good in that she's facing low energy from the voting block in whole, and Trump was starting to peel some voters off. I think that this comment not only has juiced energy, obviously, and turnout for this election among this voting block, but also, it is a chance to lop off 15 to 20 percent of Trump Puerto Rican voters from this voting block. So you're going to have a disproportionately high turnout of Puerto Rican voters in Pennsylvania, and you're going to have a lot of them who do not like Kamala Harris come out and vote for Kamala Harris. So you could be looking at a 40, 50, 60,000 net vote change um, because of everything that has happened. Uh, and just to show this, there was a, a Puerto Rican rapper, Nicky Jam, who endorsed Trump, one of the two prized Puerto Rican endorsements Trump um, tr- Trump received. Well, an hour before recording this podcast, Sean, he just came out and disavowed Trump, re- revoked his endorsement. Um, so it's, it's so universal that a a uh, Puerto Rican celebrity whose audience probably was more sympathetic to Trump is now feeling it from his audience that he has to pull the endorsement. Um, so yeah, I do think that this is going to be the reason why Harris wins uh, Pennsylvania if it's if it's even remotely close. Um, and it's the biggest uh, unforced Steve Bartman-like era and this comedian mm-hmm. deserves everything that uh, he's going to get thrown at him. Well, at the same time as he deserves it, what he is really doing is reflecting what this campaign is about. That's why it matters. So I think it would be wrong for the Republicans to blame this guy, even though I'm sure that's what's going to happen. And he is playing an important role by instigating this reconsideration of Trump among key voters. But it's not really his fault. It's Trump's fault. He sets the tone. He sets the standard. He has created this permission culture among the Republican Party for people to say things like this. And he absolutely bears responsibility for what's happening right now. But we've been talking a lot now about things that make us feel 
confident for Harris, messages that are breaking through now that we're pleased about. I do want to talk about a message that is frustrating me and something that makes me cautious and uh, is making me quite annoyed, really, about where the race is right now. A misperception, I think, that has made its way into the electorate that I think is really wrong, but I think is sticking. And so this is the idea that Trump is an anti-war candidate, a dove, that there were not wars or conflicts during his presidency, and that uh, he represented a time of peace in the past, Biden and Harris represent a time of war, and so on. I think that this message has been breaking through to the public, and a lot of people are reacting to it. J.D. Vance, in particular, I think has been very successful at pushing this message out. He was a general carrying out orders. Because I know John Kelly's worldview, and I know the people who have attacked Donald Trump the most vociferously on foreign policy, they'll say, well, he's a dictator, when what they really mean is they won't listen. He, w- Donald Trump wouldn't listen to the leadership of the military when they wanted him to start ridiculous conflicts. That is a consistent theme. And I think that there's a big, big thing going on in American politics. It's a very interesting theme in American foreign policy, where a lot of of former members of the Pentagon bureaucracy, a lot of old neoconservatives, they have a fundamental difference with Donald Trump on the question of peace and war. I believe Donald Trump is the candidate of peace. I think the record supports that. But the reason these guys go after him so vociferously, I don't think that it's about his personality, Jake. I think that it's about they don't like that Donald Trump said no when a lot of them wanted to start a ridiculous war. So part of the reason this frustrates me so much is because I think it is really completely wrong for a lot of reasons to help explain why this frustrates me so much, right? So Justin, you know the song, We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel, right? Of course, classic. Yeah, yeah. Pope Paul, uh, Malcolm X, British politician sex, and so on, right? So do you know the story about how the song was written and why it was written? I do not. So- Supposedly, Billy Joel was socializing with Sean Lennon, the son of John Lennon. And Sean Lennon was talking to Billy Joel about how, oh my goodness, in my time, in my youth, the world has been crazy. There's been so many insane wars and events going on. You don't understand this at all, Billy Joel, because you grew up in the 1950s when nothing was happening. Everything was peaceful back then. You know, It was a time of white picket fences and stable families and no wars in the world. It was before all the chaos of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And Billy Joel looked at Sean Lennon and said, what are you talking about? I remember the 1950s. It was a crazy time. There were wars happening all over the world. There was the civil rights movement then. There was all sorts of instability, the Cold War, the the war in Korea, uh, the Suez crisis. The 1950s was not a time of peace and stability. I was there. I remember it. We do all think of the 1950s in the wrong way. There is the stereotype even now that the 1950s was this time of stability and harmony in American society. Uh, But uh, Billy Joel tried to outlay in the song all the reasons why that was wrong and listed all of the significant events of the 50s that had gotten forgotten, right? And he was there. He remembered it. So this is the way I feel about the Trump years because I was in the Middle East during the Trump years. I was there. And so when I hear people say that the Trump years in the Middle East were this time of peace and stability... I'm saying, what are you talking about? I remember this. It was an insane time in the Middle East. And there were so many outrageous events, so many wars, so many conflicts, so much instability and insecurity. And I think that the American public seems either not to know about that or to have forgotten. And I think it's very disappointing that more people aren't trying to correct the record. I agree. Potentially, some of it is their concern that the message and narrative won't break through due to just the context of the fact that there's Russia Ukraine war. It's been going on for a while. Israel Palestine issues that have been going on for a while. Israel Iran starting to now escalate. Uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we understand that was set into motion poorly by for, uh, former President Trump, but 13 U.S. American soldiers did die. Uh, during that pullout. So the the fact that Biden is president right now, a Democrat is president with all of these wars raging, it's very hard for a message like the one that you are pointing out very accurately um, to break through. That doesn't mean that there shouldn't have been attempts. It's just 
I think that they were trying to minimize it so it didn't become, uh, you know, one of the top three or four issues in the campaign. Well, I definitely agree with you about the problem. I think it's because the war in Ukraine and the wars that Israel are now involved in have been getting so much attention in the press and they're so top of mind. Uh, But to your point about Afghanistan, not only was that disaster set in motion by Trump, the events in Ukraine and Israel are also related to decisions that were made during Trump's presidency, because those conflicts were actually going on when Trump was president. So we often hear about how the war in Ukraine started in 2022. People who are familiar with the issue always are frustrated by this, roll their eyes by this, because we know that the war in Ukraine started in 2014. And that the war in Ukraine was going on the entire time that Trump was in office. Every single day that Trump was president, there was war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, There was a significant escalation in the war in 2022. And that's important. And the scale of suffering and violence has dramatically increased. But we had a four-year period when Trump was in office, when the war was going on, where Russia were occupying Ukrainian territories. And Trump's response to this was to try to use it uh, to manipulate foreign leadership to illegally support his presidential campaign. He was impeached by for this, as, as we remember. That period did not successfully resolve the war. There were not successful negotiations and the war during that period. I want to talk about all of the conflicts and all of the disasters and all of the instability and insecurity that was happening in the Middle East during Trump's presidency that seems to have gone completely forgotten by the general public. During the time that Trump was in office, we in the Middle East viewed the region as particularly unstable, perhaps more unstable than it had been in recent memory. Uh, The rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which most experts consider the core central source of instability in the region, had reached its most dangerous point. Iran were directly attacking Saudi Arabian territory on Saudi oil fields, which the Saudis still recall today as a historical national trauma. Um, Some of these conflicts were encouraged and exacerbated by Trump's leadership and decision making. He was a friend to chaos, a friend to instability, and a friend to war. He encouraged Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates to blockade Qatar, the United States' closest ally in the Arabic-speaking world, trying to overthrow the regime of our closest ally, where the Al Udaid Air Base, the largest American base in the Middle East, is located, trying to starve out the population of that country and overthrow the regime. This was something that Trump's advisors had uh, reacted to with shock and horror, which Trump and his son-in-law, Kushner, had actively encouraged. Uh, Trump also assassinated one of the leading military figures in Iran, uh, Qasem Soleimani, inside of Iraqi territory, which was almost certainly a war crime under international law and which pushed the United States closer to a direct conflict with Iran than it had ever previously been. Trump dramatically expanded U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen, which led to a cholera outbreak and to the famine and death of hundreds of thousands of people. Trump encouraged Turkey to invade Syria, turning the Syrian civil war, which had started during President Obama's presidency, into a true international interstate conflict, which it hadn't really been up to that point. Um, this was something that uh, shocked and appalled many American commentators, as some Americans might remember, because of the previous U.S. support to the uh, Kurdish uh, militias that were operating inside of northern Syria and were put at risk by Turkey's invasion. Uh, Trump, in in effect, greenlit Turkey to invade this other country and turning that war into an interstate war. The war in Libya, the escalation of the conflict between General Hiftar and the GNA, that was something that was occurring during that time. A new war between Armenia and Azerbaijan exploded in the last months of Trump's presidency over Nagorno-Karabakh. In the last months of Trump's presidency, a war in Ethiopia, quite near the Middle East, exploded, a war that some experts and analysts believe has led to the deaths of 600,000 people. And the behavior of regional actors was so wild and so unhinged, uh, encouraged by Donald Trump in this unstabilizing direction. If anyone recalls, one of the most extraordinary events of, of that period was when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia appeared to have kidnapped the prime minister of Lebanon and made him record a hostage video. This was behavior that was directly encouraged by an enthusiastic Donald Trump. He was a force for instability, uh, wars, chaos, and conflict in the region. I think that the perception that he is a force for peace in the Middle East is ludicrous when put up against 
this record. Part of the reason why people don't maybe know or care as much about this is because the Israeli-Palestinian conflict gets so much more attention than almost anything else that happens in the Middle East. But if you look at Trump's record on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, people who would like to see a peaceful resolution would be quite disappointed. Uh, Trump uh, appro- gave U.S. approval to Israel's annexation of not one but two occupied territories, one being the Golan Heights and the other being East Jerusalem, provocatively building a new U.S. embassy in Jerusalem, which is still a disputed territory under international law. They unveiled uh, a, a supposed peace plan called the Peace for Prosperity Plan. This was Jared Kushner's uh, initiative for Arab-Israeli peace that uh, included um, Israel annexing another 30% of the West Bank. Uh, that was rejected, of course, by the Palestinians, by others. Um, they introduced this initiative that they called the Abraham Accords, which was trying to circumvent the Arab Peace Initiative and freeze the Palestinians out of the Arab-Israeli dialogue by bringing recognition deals between Gulf states and Israel that did not include any progress on the Palestinian issue, any recognition of a Palestinian state, any move towards Palestinian sovereignty of the occupied territories. This also was perhaps a factor in the war that has exploded since in Sudan because of the way that the Trump administration dealt with generals who were trying to frustrate uh, a move towards democratic revolution in that country. So if you look at the record of Trump in the Middle East, you see this kind of chaos, this kind of uh, promotion of aggression by Iran, by Saudi Arabia, by Turkey, by Israel. And it's not hard to imagine how he would escalate conflicts that we are all hoping will de-escalate. Now, the idea that Trump is some kind of dove, uh, which has been heavily promoted by J.D. Vance, it's not only ludicrous when you look at events in the Middle East. So J.D. Vance has claimed that John Kelly, Jim Mattis, and Mark Milley are motivated to criticize Trump and call him a fascist because they are war hawks and Trump is a dove. And they were upset that Trump is moving to end wars around the world. Uh, This is not something that is actually supported by evidence at all. In fact, the opposite is probably a more accurate reading of historical events. So I want to draw people's attention to a story that is, again, little noticed or remembered in the record of Trump's presidency, which is Trump's enthusiasm to launch an American invasion of Venezuela. There's reporting in a number of different outlets, including the Associated Press, that Trump demanded that generals and the Defense Department draw up plans for the United States to invade Venezuela. Uh, It was, in fact, the same people that J.D. Vance claims were too eager for war to abide by President Trump, who frustrated these plans, slowed them down, and eventually stopped them. This account is not only based on stories that journalists heard from those men. They're also validated by uh, sources from other countries like Colombia, the United States' closest ally in South America, who heard Trump express his interest in invading Venezuela and spoke about his uh, direction to draw military plans for an invasion. Colombian officials talked to journalists and told them Trump wanted to invade a country, and these generals and these officials tried to prevent that from happening. Yes, in the whole entire argument of Trump being a dove really started in 2016. But as you remember, once it became clear that Trump was unhinged to everybody, the argument shifted to, well, at least he'll have adults in the room, folks that could restrain him and and talk him down. There really is no coherent Trump foreign policy strategy. And in addition to that, uh, the adults will not be in the room this time around. It's very likely to be filled with just pure Trump sycophants. So if a foreign leader offends him, who's going to be there to stop and tell him, no, you can't send B-52 bombers to, um, uh, you know, Mexico because they don't want to pay for the wall? Was Cash Patel going to be that person? Um, So no, I I agree with you. I think this is a very important issue. And I I think that uh, the campaign and the media haven't nearly spent enough time on this issue. Um, But unfortunately, it's too late. And we're just going to have to hope that uh, the prevailing view that Trump is a dove isn't going to be enough to sway the 
thousands of voters in swing states that could determine the election. J.D. Vance can go on every TV show and say that Donald Trump is a non-interventionist, that he's a dove, that the generals who are criticizing him are the true hawks. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is asking to invade Venezuela, is campaigning on the promise to start a war in Mexico, uh, would like Israel to annex more and more occupied territories, uh, encourages conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, encourages conflict between Turkey and Syria, on and on and on and on. Meanwhile, he's still being backed by some of the most hawkish voices in the Republican Party, people like Mike Pompeo, people like Tom Cotton. I think that any voter who is buying this stuff from J.D. Vance, that Trump is the peace candidate, that Trump is the dove, uh, unfortunately, you've bought a bag of magic beans. I think uh, we will all find out this Tuesday how many of those voters bought that bag of magic beans. We hope everybody uh, enjoyed this episode and gets out and vote and phone bank and do whatever you can. 